So we got 3.33 in the morning. And uh, so my insomnia, or just not sleeping right, continues. But right now I have to find, I have to not bang my head on the microphone, which would be a start. I have to find the mute button. There. Because uh, I just spent like, literally, this is going to sound insane, and it is insane. I think I just spent six hours. I found something addictive thing where like people are addicted to jigsaw puzzles or playing video games. It's like I found this addictive thing where, you know, when I was reading my audio book, I hunt for pictures and try to match them up to parts in the book, which is totally stupid. Because the whole point of a book is you get to make your own pictures in your head. You know, I covered that when I was talking about the Meryl Streep thing. If you watch a movie, Meryl Streep looks like Meryl Streep. But if you're reading a book about somebody named Meryl Streep, she, you conjure up your own, you know, your own version of it. You know, and you take away different things from it. A, a book is like, you know, it, it's personal that way. You see a movie, you can interpret it different ways, but you're looking at pictures and... You're not making your own inside your head. So it's just dumb that I just did this. I'm fucking exhausted and I will do it and not eat. I'm just like, just do it and not eat for like hours. And um, a couple of chapters in there, like one chapter called New York City. In this book that I promised that I'm going to release before Sunday. Coming up. Um, I'm like... I didn't fall into that trap. I just took an old time of um, a crazy picture of New York in the 1800s around where, where the book was set and just left it at that. But no, I have to take the longest chapter of the book, which is 120 minutes, and I have to like splice in hundreds of pictures, trying to match it up to the word, trying to make you know my own little movie which doesn't even make any sense because half the times the pictures don't match you'd be surprised how hard that it is but it's just a weird thing like it's challenging for me to try to find pictures that fit sometimes you find an ideal freaking picture you know like um the landing of sir william howe during the revolutionary war okay i found a painting of that it's perfect you know and then there's another the thing in there, you know, without spoilers or anything, there's another thing in there where there's a specific description of an animal. And I spent a half an hour just looking through pictures trying to find an animal that matches this animal. And it's like, why am I doing this? I need to stop this. You know, it's just dumb. I just, it's just... A, it's it's somehow it's compelling to me. It's like a jigsaw puzzle, puzzle. And uh, anyways, so I, you know the last video where I spilled the beans about having um, big time Ohio State uh, star. Then he went on to NFL football, but he was uh, a malcontent. And he, well, he's part of my family. <laughs> so, you know, with all the killers and the uh, sexual deviants and the uh, madmen and all that. So, naturally, he didn't get along. He, didn't, he doesn't play well with others. And he's a big shot at Ohio State. And uh, one of the, considered one of the best at his positions in the country. When you get to the pros and you go from the uh, big fish in a little pond to the big fish in the ocean you know, I may have butchered that metaphor but then I've been spending my brain looking at pictures and trying to fit them into these things and you have to c cut the pictures down to the right length and match them to the words it's fucking stupid um but yeah that uh, other video where I spilled the beans and I said my last name which eventually you will know my last name, but there will be be a reason for it. And I'm sure, you know, you, you're just waiting with bated breath for that day. But uh, anyways, I think it gives a damn. But um, um, 
this uh yeah this book will get done i mean i lost my train of thought but it, oh in the other video I'm, it's just pure exhaustion i'm not drugged i'm just pure exhaustion i was up for like 24 damn hours 25 hours something like this then i'm drugged i'm not gonna lie um knees kept was killing me you know i uh I went to my doctor's appointment because the last video was like, haha, I got 10 hours before I go to the doctor's appointment. I didn't eat. I slept. I, I went to sleep at 7 in the morning and woke up at 10 a.m. I went in there and I killed it at that doctor's appointment, man. I mean, um, you know, I convinced him to sign off on a prescription for a mobility scooter. Because the next mobility scooter above that piece of shit that I, I bought that didn't work is $400 more. Who knows if that one's going to work. But like I said, to get a good mobility scooter, you need somewhere between $1,500 and $3,000. Period. To get a good one. So, I got him to sign a prescription for that. Not only did I get him to sign a prescription for that, but he was like, well, they're probably, they might want to... You know, they set up a separate appointment for that, you know, and then it's like, oh, Christ. Um, it's going to be like a month before I get to, to even see you again. And he was like, um, you know, they'll, they'll want to set you up with a motor, motorized wheelchair because they'll want to know if there's anything wrong with your arms. And I'm like, you don't understand, Doc. The only people I have, I don't have anybody to depend on in this city. The only people I have to depend on that live in this city are either uh, drug addicts or have emotional problems, or both. I said I have a I have a prescription waiting for me in the drugstore that I can't get. That's been in there for like four days. You know, I didn't mention the fact that it was my suicide pill because I felt that that was an extraneous detail that he didn't need to know. But um, you know, like like my tenth bottle of my uh, final option uh, pills that I never take. I always tell everybody, like, you know, I'm supposed to take them as needed, but I never take them. I just, I don't take them because they're sleep aids and they last, like, forever. And, uh, anyways, so I just came in there with two gold. The thing about, like, the, the motorized wheelchair thing is, like, like, look, I need to do shopping on this thing, like, grocery shopping. I mean, I mean, I need a like with a mobility scooter you got a basket on the front you could put a basket on the back I need self-sufficiency because the people I am dependent on I, I say this in so many words I used I definitely said they're involved with crack because I figured that would help my cause or whatever so he just you know instead of scheduling a separate appointment to uh over it he just like green lighted it right there so he was like, you know, I'm going to sign off on the uh, on the mobility scooter for you. I was just very, very good. Well, I managed that without eating. Literally without eating. And uh, without sleeping three hours. I don't know. But maybe that's what I have to do when I go see Dr. Wacky Pants. Is uh, be totally exhausted and deprived of nutrition. And uh, then I will make sense to him. <laughs> instead of being well nourished and well rested and having all my logical uh, faculties intact I'll just go in there complete and total wreck and he'll be like oh, okay now we understand each other so yeah so that was good that was a productive visit you know that was an interesting day altogether because uh, my, one of my clocks was screwed up I got like three clocks in this place one on the computer a stupid alarm clock that the uh, crop-eared cat or the cat with the uh, cauliflower ear destroyed some time ago because he's a quirky animal. And I have a clock on the wall. Well, I listened to the wrong clock. And um, my second cousin, who's got PTSD, was out on the porch. And um, so I went out an hour early. You know, I figured I'll go out there and I'll talk to the dude for like 10 minutes, you know, and try to... You know, square things away and make sure, make him understand that, you know, we're at, we're at peace with each other. And it's, it's like it's nothing. I'm just hold up from everybody and, you know, try to get him like the nothing personal type of level thing. 
I go out an hour early for my appointment. I talk to this dude for like an hour and 15 minutes. He's talking about burning down houses and um, other stuff. You know, he let, he was talking about committing acts of arson and stuff. Like, he's like, you know how to burn that building? You know, he's talking about that meth house. And he said, man, somebody ought to burn that down. You know, and you know, you don't need, I mean, I was like, arson's a pretty serious crime. He goes, nah, I've done it before. You can get away with it. It's not that big a deal. I'm like, okay. He's like, he's like, nah, I've been in jail before. And he's like, you know, it's like, um, yeah. He's like, I'm just, I just drink a lot and I throw all my beer cans out the back. When he asked me like twice if that bothered me, and I'm like, dude, I can't even walk back there. You can make a big pile of cans. He said, I just throw them out my window into a big pile, and then I clean them up, and I take them to get recycled when the pile gets too big. And I'm like, that's cool. And he's out there smoking a blunt, you know. This, I, this is at uh, 2.20 in the afternoon. And, um, you know, I was like, uh, it was funny because I uh, I was like, man, I'll give you a dollar for a cigarette. I forgot I didn't have no dollars on me. I just had a five. So... Uh, I was like, it's cool, man. You know, it's it's like, uh, I only want the one, you know. I don't remember what he said about the whole dollar for a cigarette thing, but he gave me a cigarette. I said, it's for after I get, I don't want to smell like smoke going into the doctor. It's for after I get out, I always want a cigarette. But then, I re then I, you know, he looked at the time, and I realized I was out there, like, way early. So, like, I'm smoking a cigarette, and I smoked a cigarette, and I said, you got any gum or anything like that? So he just gives me, like, comes down with like a huge bag of jelly beans and just like, like starts jumping like dumping like two pounds of jelly beans in my hands I'm like whoa 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 stop stop you know I had all, I still got jelly beans man I <laughs> like jelly beans but I, I said if you got candy gum or anything that'll cover up the you know the cigarette breath or whatever you don't want to go to a doctor that hates smoking and smell like that and uh so he was like, uh, yeah, I'll leave you some uh, cigarettes in the mailbox, you know. And I was like, uh, so I told him, like, well, that's five bucks. So, you know, just the next few times I see you, if I bum a cigarette, it'd be cool if you just let me have one. And, you know, I told him, like, don't knock on my door. And that pissed him off. That pissed him off. He said, when have I ever knocked on your door? You know, I, I was like, no, no, never. I know that. I, I know that. I just, you know, I'll come out here and talk to you. If I see you, I'll talk, see you sitting out here. I'll be glad to come out and talk to you and stuff like that. I just don't like nobody knocking on my door and bothering me. And I keep trying to, you know, it's not personal. Don't take the shit personal. You know, I know you know how to handle uh, weapons and you was in a war and stuff like that. And just don't take the shit personal. I just don't want nobody knocking on my door and fucking bothering me. So anyways, I'm having a conversation with this dude. And this is very interesting. It's like, uh, he claims that there's eight people living in this. There's only one person whose name is on the list, and that's Stampy Sr. He's claiming that there's eight people living up there. Now, all I do is I spend my time in my prison. I can't see shit. I don't sit in my living room where I got the windows and I got the contact to the porch and I can see who's coming and going or whatever. And I asked him, I said, is there a lot of traffic coming back and forth? Because that's never a good sign when you got a lot of traffic coming back and forth. And I said, that's a sign of uh, drug activity. And he was like, yeah, there's been a lot of traffic. He said, you got eight people living over top of you. I don't know if you know that. And I looked down the ramp and there's just like kids' toys all down the, the wheelchair ramp and shit pissed me off and that's fucking disrespectful and um uh so you know that's one thing hearing it from him but then I go to my appointment and the doctor make wait makes me wait an hour which he never does you know I've, I've had doctors make me wait up to an hour and a half to two hours you know just sitting there waiting on them in the exam room but this guy made me wait over an hour I don't know why or what what was going on? He was claiming something about we got new computer systems or whatever that. But maybe that made him more amenable to my pitch for him to sign off on a mobility scooter. Which, if he didn't sign off on that, I'm dumping eleven hundred bucks, like on May third. So, 
you know, leaving me very little money left, because that would be $700 wasted on the other scooter, and then that's almost $2,000 right there, and, uh, I still have bills to pay, and I still have to buy a certain amount of food and stuff, you know, I still have to live, and, uh, so, anyway, so I get home from the doctor's, and I see the neighbor woman, you know, mowing the grass, like, all the way around, and back over by Eric's over here, now, Eric showed up, the guy that lives next to me that had, had a family, and he's like, I'm getting the fuck out of here, and I'm moving, now, he's had this car out there for, like, ever, the city must be threatening to tow it, because he was out there trying to start it, and he couldn't get it started, and it's not that bad of a car or anything. It's just been sitting there forever. It's been sitting there since last summer with, when he just took off because of the meth trade that was flourishing here. But anyways, this woman, she's cutting the grass all the way out in front of my house and all the way down the side here by my boat like that. So I'm like, well, I'm already talking to, you know. I went in and I talked to a guy in a wheelchair and I asked him about traffic and he's like, eh. He's like, I don't really think there's that much traffic. So he was a dissenting opinion. But the interesting thing is when I talk to the neighbor lady, she come up with the same number of eight. What's the odds of that? <laughs> she said there's eight people living. And, you know, it's these are like, like my apartment is a long hallway, a big living room, a hallway to the kitchen, a bathroom, and a bedroom. So, you know, and it's on Stark Metropolitan Housing. So I'm trying to think, you know, there's a way that I could probably work it around if I wanted to do what I've done a billion times, and that's get people thrown the fuck out of here. There's some way I can work that, you know. I can find out exactly who's on the lease. I think only one person's on the lease because when they moved in, they were one person, and they had a boyfriend that come, would come around on a motorcycle. And then the daughter would come around. And then the daughter's boyfriend would come around. And now there's two kids up there. And now there's an old woman, an older woman up there, like a grandma to the kids. And uh, I don't know who's all living up there. But I don't know how Stark Metropolitan Housing feels about that. If they're only, you know, <laughs> if, if they're like, uh, yeah, we're just paying for the building. You can, you know, you can have it like a, a clown car if you want jam as many people as you want to in it but uh, I could talk to my landlord I could find out exactly who's on the lease up there and then I could call Stark Metropolitan Housing or I could even look it up on the computer and I could find out like you know how they feel about just having a house full of people that are just you know not on the lease in a uh, Stark Metropolitan Housing uh, place the thing is, you got that gray area of guests. You know, they can say they're guests. They could live there, like, uh, I don't know how many hours is in a week. They could leave, live there all but, like, five hours in a week and say they're guests. They just visit all day and then, you know, sleep over some nights. But they're guests, you know. So there's a real gray area in there. I know, already know I'm going to get zero help from my landlord. I already know this. But, you know, I... I deal, I can deal with the police like I did last year, and this year I maybe can try dealing with the actual agency that's paying for the building, so I'm not in my prison anymore, um, but, uh, yeah, that was an interesting day yesterday, it seems like forever ago, well, it's not, I guess it's not yesterday anymore, because it's the 25th, and I went to the doctor on the 23rd, I'm quite exhausted from my stupid, uh, obsessive behavior, uh, with that, um, hour and 20 minute chapter, um, uh, and it, it's not read that well, it's one of the earlier chapters that I read before I figured out the Mubavi program, so, you know, I'm learning though, which is cool, because I'm re, I just, I'm working, you know, I'm, I'm listening to other parts that I do, and I'm like, man, I'm reading pretty good here, but this 120 minute part, I'm not reading that well, you know, I think I can do this, you know, I think I can get pretty good at it, and uh, even with the my knee stabbing me and the uh, 
uh, benzo issues i think i can get pretty good at it because i can i got the, the movari program now where i can just i don't have to sit there and read correctly for 20 minutes in a row you know i, I the thing that people got on nobody has to understand anything the thing about nar narration is you can just disconnect the words I, I i i wish i could think of a good example right now but you can just like um the man was sitting over there or you could say the man was sitting over and then just a pause will change it or um you know it, especially if it's worded weird and like this book is worded you know the man sitting over there or he was sitting over there you know there's a real subtle little things in there about how you fit the words together which i'm kind of figuring out and um i was a quitter when i was growing up i was the guy that threw the chessboard or the checkerboard or like i don't want to play anymore i was a quitter so um i you know i'm learning i've learned through the years that there's certain things that you're good at that you know you can don't have to have that patience for there's other things that you can actually work at and become passable at and this is something that i love to do so i, I love books you know i love words so i can become passable but passable by it one, one I'm having pro, problems enunciating my words right now slurring my speech a bit but um and one of the interesting things that I read in the uh, Stephen King book on writing is he's like, he considers himself a good writer. He's like, um, if you work hard enough and you have the rudiments of the Eng whatever language it is you're working in, say the English language, he said, if you work hard enough, most anybody can become a good writer. But as far as a great writer, uh, you can there's no amount of work that's going to make you a great writer. You just, that's just something like, you know, the Steinbecks, the Faulkners, um, the William Shakespeare, those kind of guys, you know, they're, they're just a separate breed. They're just, that's just like, uh, he's like, he's talking about himself. He's like, he's like, no matter how hard, much I've written or whatever, I'll never hit that. Now, you can't, a good, a good writer cannot become a great writer. I'm not interested in becoming a great narrator. I'm just interesting, interested in becoming, you know, just good at it. That's all I would like to do. I don't think I can do voices. That's the problem, you know. Like, uh, what, I got this book under here. I had a book under here. Oh, uh, me and my silly self. This book, A Day No Pigs Would Die. Okay, they made, made me read this in school. I thought this was a pretty cool book. It's nothing but dialogue. And it's about the Mennonites or Amish people or something like that, you know. So, um, you're going to have conversations with people. You can't have a conversation with people where somebody said, um, you know, say, listen, son, I want you to do some work today. But, Dad, I don't really want to do that work today. No, son, you really have to do this. It's just a job. Just think of it as a job. You have to have, like, some sort of difference in the voices. You know, and I'm not an actor. I could do that shit. And, like, I, I, I think I tried to do an Irish accent. And I, I pulled it off, like, but it was very short in um, The Last Algonquin. As you can see, my friend, friend you know, just, yeah, I'm not good at that kind of shit. So, you know, me doing a woman's voice with my voice being like it is, I don't even know how to attempt that, you know. And there is a part in the book that I'm reading. It's my, it's the most important chapter in the book. And I want to really kill it. So it's one, of, you know, I haven't, I practiced it and practiced it and practiced it and haven't done it yet. But I have to do a woman's voice, you know. And uh, I'm like, how the hell am I going to pull this off? How do you do a woman's voice if you're a dude, you know, and not sound like an idiot, not sound like you're doing a Monty, you're on Monty Python, you know. Uh, but yeah, I had a good day yesterday, or whatever day, fuck, I don't even know, 
sleep and my sleep still fucked up from crackheads. But whatever day that was where I was having those conversations with people and I got them to sign off on a scooter and I got the uh, uh, gabapentin, which is non-narcotic. -narco it's probably not good for you like most pills, but it's non-narcotic at least. Um, from my knee. I explained to the doctor. The doctor told me something interesting that I should have thought of, but I didn't think of. Is uh, He said... Um, well, what you could try doing, since you can't get Altman Hospital to fax their records to Cleveland Clinic, is you could talk to the doctor that actually made the referral and then have him uh, see if you can get their office with his say-so to fax the records because the doctor's got doctor powers. You know, they're, you know. That's like he was asking me today because he wasn't up to speed at all, you know. He was like, uh, he, he wasn't even up to speed about the March 7th oper the operation thing I had where they found I had a blood clot. He said, I'm interested in this blood clot thing. I said, where'd you have that done at? He's with affiliated with Altman. I'm like, Altman, so it should be easy for you to find. And just, you know, call Altman Radiology. And he goes, okay. And then I said, I wish it was that easy for me, but then you're a doctor, so it won't be no problem for you. And I explained the problems I was having, and he's like, well, you should should try calling the orthopedia, orthopedist that refers you to Cleveland Clinic, so, you know, they will send your records. Because I don't even know if me walking into Altman will be enough for Altman to... Fa I got the guy's, guy that gave me his card and everything, but... You know, I gave them that number over the phone and they wouldn't do it. You know, maybe, like I said, maybe they need to see a face, an ID, or whatever. You know, it's, it's all very complicated. I haven't seen any more, like, roaches around here. Not cockroaches. Her roaches. I haven't seen any more of those around here. You know, I don't know if the additional people in there are bringing them in here. I know that the... The uh, guy with the PTSD kicked out the person that's actually on the lease who told me that they hated living here even before they got in a situation where um, she took pity on that guy and let him in. And, um, you know, I'm hearing all different kind of stories, but that's just typical. You know, they're associated with the household over here where I'm like, I'm done. I'm not having anything to do with any of you people. All it causes me is aggravation and loss of money. You don't have any respect for me at all. You know, you, you treat my property like garbage. Uh, take money out of my pocket. And, you know, it's like you're not healthy people. You know, what I was talking about in the other thing, it's like... Um, so they might not be bad people, but they're not healthy, so it doesn't matter. It's like um, un unhealthy love is lots of times, uh, or unhealthy affection. You're getting unhealthy love or unhealthy affection, or an un unhealthy uh, uh, people coming at you with a relationship is a lot worse than getting no love at all. Because, uh, you know, if that's love, what I'm getting, where, you know, people are trying to uh, uh, sell my boat with a foot of water in it and just, you know, trashing my property. I don't know. You know I, I had a specific purpose in coming on here besides killing time uh, before my uh, Muvavi program processes the torturously long video that I just made. Um, well, yeah, probably just to tell you about the doctor appointment. But yeah, I gotta get off my ass, man. Tomorrow's Thursday, Friday, Saturday. I went, got, I made a promise to myself that I was gonna get this out. I cannot do what I did today, which is just spend all day working on one chapter putting pictures in it you know you know i got like it's it's a 21 part book um with i, I think it's 21 22 part book with 21 chapters um 
and I got like 16 of them already downloaded and I just have to read three of them and um, one of them is easy one of them is very important and I need to kill and the other one I haven't explored but it should be easy um, yeah, which I shouldn't have any problem with I just can't get caught in that trap you know of doing that this is just important to me I don't know why it's important to me to do this or I think that this guy's story is important you know or the funny part about it is is like you know that part of it's real and part of it's fabrication the guy even says at the beginning of the in the in the Ford he said can this be taken as a historical document probably not is it just a product of my imagination definitely not you know but uh, I'll talk about that later like I'll do a little like uh, epilogue about uh, um, what exactly went down with the book and uh, how it's an heirloom from a father to a son because the actual story takes place in 1925 and then the guy passes the story down to his son and then his son writes it down in a book and then there's an awesome video that I found that I'm going to include on there that has the father and the son um, applying some of that uh, Indian know-how or Native American know-how sorry about the Indian thing but that's written in 1982 and they say Indian and then they're about a billion times so um, anyways there's clearly Native American know-how involved in what this guy is doing you know the guy that actually supposedly had the relationship with the last Algonquin and, and um, you know his son's there and his son is like I don't know 10 or 12 years old and it's like a home movie and it's really funny because it's it's a guy doing a voiceover to a home movie and the stuff you know it's boring and fascinating at the same time it's like there's interesting things going on there but because he's narrating it and it's a home movie it's like it's just weird you know it's, 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 it, it was a real find for me to find that and a real treat I was like there's the people in the book you know and all the places and everything and um, to even have an island called uh, the, the last Algonquin's name is Joe Two Trees they even have an island that's called Two Trees Island, but you know, you know, trees multiply. So, and he, he was named after the island because it had two trees on it. And I'm doing spoilers now, and you know, I should be shot for doing this. But uh, the the island that he was named after, it still exists, but it don't have two trees on it anymore because it was named, you know, when he was born, and he was born. God, when was he born? Um, he was born in the 19th century, you know, so even though it's a small island, it's got about 8, 9, 10, 12 trees on it, um, so it's not really, and I, it doesn't really match the description, but then, you know, uh, any, anybody that's smart enough to uh, listen to a book will realize that, yeah, trees reproduce, and uh, he was named after that island in like uh, maybe 1889 or something, you know. Um, but I show that island like several times, um, and uh, I found I found a, a picture of a, a the perspective where a guy is standing on Two Trees Island and uh, looking out, but that's like. It seemed like it was pointless, so I didn't include that. But uh, you have a good time doing this kind of stuff. You know, I, I can sit there, forget about eating or forget about anything, and just concentrate on it. Just like when I used to write, you know, I, I would write for so long that I would get cramps in my legs and stuff. I would just sit there and I would be able to concentrate and focus. And I can sit there and I can focus, you know, benzo or no benzo thing. I can focus on. Um, not the reading part so much, I still have trouble with that, but I mean this whole idea of like, if 
finding pictures and trying to fit the pictures while I'm listening to the narrative. Now, the reading thing was a real problem because, you know, like you can see, you can hear the difference in between the chapters is because you're like, some of them, I am not doing too good. And you can tell that, you know, oh, that's from the uh, Xanax days, you know. And then you have the volume chapters. And the volume chapters, are, you know, I'm pretty proud of some of them. Pretty ashamed of some of what's in there, you know. But I was like, at some point when I was on the Xanax thing and I kept, like, screwing it up, I was like, uh, I'm not going to be perfectionist about this because I'm never going to get done, you know. But, um... Oh, I think it was Stephen King again. I must have read... The guy likes to talk a lot. He does a lot of interviews and stuff, but he thinks of his books as all uh, wayward children that he would like to call in and correct. You know, he's like... he, he He's never, like, uh, happy with the uh, results. You know, he can be happy overall that he wrote something that's entertaining and good, but it could be better, you know. Like he's like I I like to call them back in like they were all wayward wayward children, and give them a talking to and correct them. Um. But yeah, I don't know if I can sleep or or what. I my sleep schedule is so so effed up, and uh, I'm such a foul mouth person. It's kind of silly for me to say effed up. I was swearing on Easter. I think that offended somebody. Or maybe some of the stuff I said on Easter when I was talking about uh, Nebuchadnezzar and uh, um, the book of Job. But I have a great deal of respect for uh, literature and I've, I've uh, read the Bible cover to cover. And a lot of it's quite boring, frankly, but a lot of it's fascinating. The book of Jonah everybody talks about the whale and it's like the least interesting part of that book the interesting part about the book of Jonah is he gets the call from God and he's supposed to go preach to these Ninevite peoples and, and you know prevent them from incurring God's wrath and he is like oh, fuck them people to hell with them people they're bad people I don't want to save them it's like they deserve whatever they get so that's why he run he runs, because he, he, he he's like they're hateful evil people man fuck them. But you know uh, according to the book God's like I want you to go preach to him and give him a chance to repent and that's why he was running. And uh, he got on that ship and then um, in the book God like made a big big storm and stuff, and then the people on board the ship they found out that uh, you know that he was uh, pissing off God but not doing what God wants and that they threw him overboard and then he got swallowed by the whale but that's what there's there was actually an expression an expression that's saying that you're a Jonah you know that just meant that you, you bring trouble and bad luck to people you know you're a Jonah these old expressions um but yeah, so anyways, it's just because I have a foul mouth and stuff. I have a great deal of, uh, of I, I believe in God. I believe in a divine spark in human beings. And I believe that we can be so much better than we are. And uh, uh, I just like colorful language, if you want to call it that. I like swearing. I like uh, improper grammar. And um, I feel like I have the right to swear. If you know my life story or even like a fraction of it. It's funny I have like my best friends like a strict um, Christian dude. Dude don't swear at all. Never heard the dude swear once ever. <laughs> and uh, guy's a policeman. And uh, he will quote people swearing. You know sometimes not always. But uh, you know. I try not to swear in front of him just out of respect because he doesn't swear. So, you know, sometimes I'll slip up or like, you know, it's, it's important to the story. I told him I answered the phone and I was like, what the fuck do you want? To, uh, you know, that's the first thing I said when I answered the phone. Um, but yeah, 
he's you know he's always like uh um you know there's an expression in the bible again i have read the bible cover to cover and read parts of it repeatedly over and over again just because it's good shit uh, there's good stuff it's good stuff in there but there's a phrase in there that i wish more people knew about it's, it's let not many of you become teachers and it's from uh paul uh what book i don't remember but it's like, uh, yeah, everybody wants to be a teacher, man. We should all be students. But everybody wants wants to teach people things because that's a position of authority. Everybody likes to be, everybody likes power and everybody likes to be the teacher and nobody likes to be the student, you know. That's when I used to debate. When I used to debate people, uh, I would seldom get beaten at it. But when I would get beaten at debate, it was like a good thing to me because it's like, now I learned something you don't learn something by just whipping people's butts you know that's like like take the uh, um, uh, the Detroit the Detroit no uh, the, the Chicago Bulls when they played the Detroit Pistons the Detroit Pistons whipped the Bulls with Michael Jordan like for three years in a row in the playoffs and kicked their asses out of the playoffs like that's how you learn is through error, mistakes, and things like that. And uh, that's how you grow and that's how you learn. So if somebody would beat me at debate, uh, unlikely as far as written debate, but possible, um, it would happen like once every six months or so. I wouldn't get mad about it. And I would be like, cool, okay, now I know. I, now I know, you know, I go back and I can look at the pitfalls that I fell into. And I was like, okay. Like, uh, um, I remember that, uh, that oh, so, uh, mistakes are a good thing, you know. Um, that's how we learn, is by making mistakes. Do everything right. Everybody, you know, quite a lot in that. Uh, let not many of you become teachers. Become a student. Be a student. Learn. Listen. Like when I went out there and I was sitting there and I was talking to the dude with the the, the PTSD. I listened. I didn't sit there and say like, well, look, you need to do this. You need to do that. You need to do that. You know, when I talked to my neighbors, I, you know, on here, of course. I'm a horrible listener when I'm on here because I can't hear what you're saying. <laughs> so yeah, of course I'm going to come across as preachy. You know, it's just me talking, trying to be entertaining, telling stories, uh, giving my views on life, trying to impart whatever I think I've learned about life. You know, someone called me preachy. It made me want to, want to laugh. It's like, uh, uh, because, um, yeah, it, I, I, I would be listening if I had a chance, but much as I try, I can't hear you. <laughs> but yeah, I was listening to um the, um that's how you learn, man. Is uh by listening to people, asking questions. Um, it's not by pontificating, you know. It's like, uh, if that comes across as what I'm doing here, um, hey, I, I can't help that. But if I, if you were here and we were talking, you would get your fair chance to say whatever the hell you wanted to say because I might learn something. Because I've learned a long time ago that is how you learn is through listening. And then when it, when you make a mistake, recognizing it, and uh, remembering it, you know. Another thing I try not to do is I try not to talk about things that I don't know about. You know, that's a good way to avoid losing at debate. It's like um, talk about what you know about. Talk, you know. Don't waste people's time. Um, uh, yeah. 
I don't talk politics. What the hell do I know about the politics? I don't care about politics. I've never cared about politics. I've voted one time in my life. And that was against uh, George W. Bush and the uh, PNAC because uh, I knew that the invasion in, of the Middle East was going to uh, be a disaster for the United States. So I felt like, you know, that I should vote against them in 2004. So I walked in to uh, the voting place was actually inside of my apartment, which was convenient. It was at this place called the Polish Club that uh, I could actually stand on my porch and look at the building. So I just walked down, you know. I would look out the building and I'd be like, there's too many people down there. I don't want to vote right now. I would look down and I'm like, oh, there's almost nobody there. I'll go vote now. But I didn't realize that people take forever to vote. So I'm like, oh, I'm only like third or third or fourth in line. Now, this is going to be a breeze. And then I'm like waiting and waiting and waiting. And it's like, man, this voting stuff sucks. But all I did was... uh. Uh, vote John Kerry just to, uh, uh, to get the warmonger dudes out of there and uh, here we are like I've heard about an Afghani death of a US um, soldier and we've been in Afghanistan um, it's almost a 20 years war now and um, you know I don't I know some things I don't like to go into you know go into a pedantic mode teacher mode or whatever but um, we learned nothing we backed the Mujahideen led by Bin Laden when uh, we when Russia was our big enemy because Russia was occupying Afghanistan and uh, you know that was like went on and on and on it put a financial drain and led to the collapse of the, of the uh, Soviet Union and uh, so, you know, we made all these promises to the uh, Bin Laden and the, the Mujahideen and how, and we didn't bother following through with them because we got what we wanted as a country. And that pissed him off. And it also pissed him off is um, they got a thing in Islam where um, you can't put up with invaders on sacred soil. And uh, we had bases in uh, Saudi Arabia. So the, the maniac bin Laden uh, decided, you know, that was, you know, he, that, uh, what was that called? Shit, I used to know that stuff. But it is, after all, 419 in the morning. Um, the fatwa, oh, a, fa a fatwa? Fatwa? It's like F-A-T-W-A, but anyway, it's like an official decree of, uh, uh, war, where he decla declared a, a kind of a war against us, and that was one of the reasons he cited. Is like we, you know, we have our bases in Saudi Arabia, and uh, we're occupying. You know, repel the invader is like a like a direct command of uh, uh, Muhammad in the Quran, which I have read the Quran. I can only cop to reading about ninety percent of it though you know because frankly I don't I, I, it doesn't trans weight trans weight okay Barbara, Barbara Waters it doesn't translate well or it's just a terrible piece of fiction and uh, it seems very derivative to me and I didn't like it I have to be honest I didn't like it I didn't like the Quran uh, I did read it um, I didn't find it you know like the Bible's kind of hit and miss, but it's freaking brilliant in spots. And the uh, uh, Book of Ecclesiastics, one of my fa Ecclesiastes is one of my favorite books of all time. The Book of Jonah is awesome. Okay, I love it, and it's short, and it's just because of you know his whole attitude about like the hell with them people, man. Why do you want to save those stupid sons of bitches? And why do I got to do it? I don't want to say them assholes. You know, his whole attitude and stuff, you know, is just hilarious. Um, but the book of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes is my, my favorite book in the Bible, with uh, Jonah being a close second. Um, 
that's one thing about um being crippled up reading all these books is like I, I do know a lot of um really out of the way things. I'm not gonna try to I I was gonna say arcane. Arcane means hidden though. But uh I don't like to use I also don't like to use um language when I'm not sure what it means. <laughs> you know. And also saying things you know, language is about communication. So saying things as simply and clearly as possible is the way to go. Okay? You never say uh, an uh, aquatic uh, uh, occlusion of your disposal system. You say a fucking clogged drain. You know, you, know, you, you just don't. <laughs> yeah. You want to be understood. There's nothing. In, uh, that is the essence of genius. In my book, is to take. Uh, I'm not saying clogged drains, but I'm thinking thinking like other complicated, abstract concepts, concepts, and boiling them down into the simplest and most easy to understand terms, like. Uh, a f and, and nailing something with just a few words um, that is the essence of uh, true genius I could probably think of, you, think of some examples if it wasn't 4 o'clock in the morning of that but um, yeah um, I'm going to drink some more of my tea My life is just going through some changes right now. That's all. Um, I have garbage like piled up in my house to where my leg is so painful. It's going to be a trial just to like clean up garbage over there. The garbage cans full, so I'm just throwing garbage on the floor. I mean, like I said, the health department would close this place down. Um, you know that's the thing is like I don't want to be whisked away like somebody who can't take care of themselves just because these medical assholes won't take a scalpel to my knee like they need to I mean I mean who that's what my uh, cop friend said he's like he's like uh, it's pretty clear you need help Steve because uh, not too many people are begging to be cut and he's like you're just going around begging for somebody to cut your knee and um, you know like just to do something yeah it's like I'm not getting anything done that's the one thing I didn't do with my doctor and I didn't really have time to do it is because he's you know is uh, I can always call him up and ask him for another referral to a different um the thing of it is is like with limited insurance you don't know who all covers what how many options I actually have but go to like some different orthopedic surgeons around here but it seems to me that I could maybe get a referral from the Dr. Scarcella guy at the Cleveland Clinic I mean it's the Cleveland Clinic they're, they're like as large as the state of Minnesota it's like they've got to have a billion orthopedic surgeons and they've got to have one that's knife happy that just likes to cut people you know just cut my knee open clean it out it's not usable like it is now, you know. Um, and, it, yeah, I'm getting kind of loud. I wonder if the people upstairs, the eight people, and there's only one person supposed to be living up there can hear me, but I don't really give a fuck. Um, yeah. What do we got here time-wise? I can't even tell how much time of your time I'm wasting because the this Muvavi thing popped up where let me see let me if I can you can see me but I can't see myself right now okay uh, X this out close this up okay oh good lord I've been talking for an hour that sounds like me 54 minutes and 50 seconds.
Mm. Yeah. Many, many mansions. Many rooms to visit in this mind of mine. And, uh, yeah. Let's think about some of the stuff I said. I used to have that cat. I really liked that cat, too. And he used to sleep. It was cool because I, I was. I had the world's most comfortable couch. And so, you know, I bought a $450 water bag because I got this dumb idea in my head because I can't wear, couldn't wear a shirt even back in my 20s. That, like, um, I'm going to be honest with you, there was two very attractive lesbians that I bought the bed off of that probably helped me fork over the cash. Um, <laughs> I thought there was, like, a lipstick lesbian and then there's the flannel shirt-wearing lesbian, but both of these lesbians were gorgeous. And I was like, oh, they were, like, doing stuff on this bed. You know, I'm, like, a uh, 20-some-year-old virgin. You know, so I thought, I found that appealing. I want to try out the water bed because I, thought, I was like, well, you know, it heat me up in the winter time, and, um, you know, maybe I'll ha it'll always be warm, and maybe I'll, like, have, uh, uh, um, not have to, you know, I'll be not, not have to worry about the whole covering up situation and stuff like that. I've actually, this is sad, I've actually, um, taken a box. When, when it's been really, I've had heating problems in buildings, and taken a box and just like hollowed it out over top so nothing would touch this middle part of me, in my stomach area, and then thrown blankets over top of me. But the problem is, is like you roll around and you move in your sleep and stuff. But um, I did that for a while until I got Mr. Space Heater over here that runs for nothing. And I used to do the whole thing with the socks on the hands, like in that one video on uh, One Pork Frog One, and um, deal with the uh, um, electric blankets and stuff like that. So, um, anyway, so I bought this water bed, and um, I had a super comfortable couch, and this cat, man, he was a, he was a cool cat. He, I don't even, I think I just started, like, feeding him, you know, he's just a neighborhood cat. And, um, yeah, I got this horrible, horrible memories, you know, it's all about how things end, it seems like, you know, because I got the horrible memory of how he died, and, um, but I also got that mem memories of him, he always, it was cool, I, I had like this big pillow and this wide couch that I would sleep on, and when he was healthy, he would like sleep right next to my head and I could just lean my head up against him like a pillow and he was a uh, pretty attractive um, long haired uh, black and gray tiger striped cat I I threw away pictures of him that I had because I just don't like to think about um, the way he passed which is the story I told in the previous video where I was talking about my uh, uh, nephew and all that I haven't gotten around to uh, write. I could write him, you know, emails and stuff. I mean, I don't know. He's got like four kids or something like that. I mean, I mean he, he married like the first girl that he come across. You know, it seems to be, I hope it's working for him. I mean, people that um, know him say that they seem to be a match for each other. But I mean, that's uh, crazy to me getting married at 20. I didn't know who the hell I was until I was 30. How are you going to get married when you don't know who the hell you are? You know? Well, we'll find out along the way. Oh, this is who I am? And this is who you are? I don't like you at all. That's why all these divorces happen. <laughs> Somet that, that whole chemical thing that happens sometimes is weird, too. Like, uh, I had that word, that thing with that woman where it was like uh, it was just like a chemical thing and it wasn't like it was weird it wasn't like uh, you know like if you're a horny dude like there's lots of good looking women around even in cow country here in Ohio the home of the big girl um, there's plenty of fine looking women around but I mean this is it's it, this is a different level like it's I don't even know how to describe it um, 
But uh, anyways, I forgot what the hell I was saying. I should get off here and stop babbling in my uh, uh, deranged from lack of sleep uh, state. Uh, I do get rather garrulous when I do not sleep. Uh, my once friend used to tell me that he would take me on car rides so he wouldn't have to listen to the radio. He said because we would drive to like Florida and places, you know, like these long car trips from Ohio to Florida. And I would just get sleepy. And I would just entertain him by talking. He said, like, yeah, that way I don't have to listen to the radio. Just listen to you babble on. Sometimes I forget my, the overall thrust of my point, though. I'm getting a little bit better about that, so um, I'm not drawing as many blanks. So I think that my brain's healing up a little better. And you can even hear it in the book, because some of those chapters, like... And I read it out of order, but some of those chapters are like Xanax chapters, and some of those chapters are volume, volume chapters. It's a pretty big difference as far as uh, uh, focus. My problem seems to be with enunciation. And it's like if you over enunciate, you just, it sounds artificial and phony. If you say something like, there was something about the man that struck me as odd. You know, instead of, there's something about the man that really struck me as odd. You know, like something unnatural about over enunciating, but you have to enunciate and you have a deep voice like mine. Uh, when you elocute, you have to enunciate and you have to, you know, speak clearly, which I have a problem with sometimes. Like, um, um, uh, saying a word. I think it's just the nature of my voice, though. It's just, I have a very deep, my voice is not made for narr narration. And it's, um, so, like, um, when I pronounce a word sometimes, it won't be crisp, we'll say. Instead of using that, you know, it won't be crisp and uh, clearly spoken. If you listen to other people that narrate, they don't sound like fog, they don't sound like a foghorn like I do. You know, they can't do the swing low, sweet chariot, low enough to carry me home. You know, they can't do, they can't reach them lows. You know, there's only one guy that uh, does horror stories that uh, has a voice anywhere near mine as far as uh, deepness. So, uh, I don't think a deep voice is a ideal uh, narration tool so you know anyways oh that's about an hour um, it's content anyway right if you it's the, it's a distraction and um, yeah I don't know like I'll put out the other one I the other ones already edited and you know, I just don't have much to do, man. It's like, you only work so long on those books. And then you get fatigued and you're not doing a good job with them anyway. And the fatigue gets to you. And uh, since, you know, getting up and going to the bathroom and getting a meal seems to cause, like, uh, seems to wake up uh, a little of uh, hellions inside my knee that begin with the little pickaxes in there, you know, working away on it, uh, it's not like I got a lot else to do, besides run my ever fucking gob, um, so, I mean, uh, unless you want me, to, you know, I can get loaded and just sit there like a moron and watch, uh, TV shows, what good is that? You know, I've wasted enough of my life. Wasted my whole twenties being out, out the lunch. And um, you know, I was poor, but there was stuff I could have been doing. I, I did like read a lot in my twenties, and I did like um, eat 
I had a theory of a language going on where like, well, like, like, you know, I can master, I had this, this is young man thinking, of course, I was like, I can master the English language if I can just, and I used to write them down and stuff, I still remember some of them, but, um, you know, if you can get into the, the Greek and the uh, Latin roots to words, it's like, um, like L-O-Q, for instance, um, the L-O-Q, whatever, or, you know, the, the middle part of that word is a uh, loquation, it's, it's speaking, you know, so you can use all these fancy words, and um, they're all using roots for like simple things, um, um, shit. Um, like trahiri is, I think, a, a, a Latin thing meaning to draw. So you got traction from that. You got uh, contraction. Anything with tract in it is comes from trahili, trahiri meaning to draw. And you know, if you um, retract something, you're taking it back or drawing it back. Re meaning back. I had this whole idea and I went through the whole dictionary. I went through a whole dictionary. I don't even know if I still own the dictionary. I think it's in pieces. But um, I would just like highlight. And I was working on like a system. And uh, you know life always intervenes. It's like bad shit happens. You get involved with stupid people. And uh, you know. But yeah. I remember all that. I still have some of the papers where I was like, if I get these basic roots down that all these words come from, then, you know, when I'm reading something, then I realized something. I was like, it's much more important than knowing all these words. And, you know, it's not so much like what you wear, like, it's what's underneath, you know. It's like, I can dress up in the fanciest suit of whatever. This is still a wrecked body. <laughs> I can dress up my language. And if the content isn't there, if the meaning isn't there, you know, uh, it's not going to matter. So, I kind of figured that out while I was working on that. I still would have liked to have done that, because that, that's interesting and it's useful as a writer. It can allow you to be... Uh, uh, clever and it, it 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 can allow you to like uh, um, hmm, I would call it layering but there's certain things that you can do when you write when you uh, have that kind of command of the language where you can um, uh, layer things where like um, uh, it works on this level it works on that level and you know um, hmm trying to think I, uh, my brother was scoffing at an example of that and I was explaining to him I was like no that's actually quite clever uh, the way that's called because that has like a, a couple of meanings to it you you can bring uh, like uh, a depth to things too uh, that way but uh, no I'm no great writer I'm just a good writer I'm not a great writer um, but I have to have some ability with language to be able to even talk like this for an hour and ten minutes, you know. Uh, without even telling you, I didn't tell you any morbid stories at all. This, you must feel cheated. You know, no, no, mo no, no morbid stories. I have one reference to arson. That's about it. Not a drop of blood was spilled in the creation of this video. Uh. <laughs> well, anyways, that's an hour and ten minutes of your time. Those of you that find me entertaining as I struggle through life and life continues to kick me in the balls. Um, you know, 
when I was telling the story of Job, it's not like I consider myself Job or whatever. It's just like I was thinking of that. It just, I thought of that. Like It's a movie called The Haunted starring Benicio Del Toro and Tommy Lee Jones. Tommy Lee Jones is like an expert survivalist and an expert with knives that's uh, treat, uh, trained special forces guys. Benicio Del Toro one of his best students that goes nuts and then he has to go hunt him down that's why it's called the hunted I think and it was at the beginning of the movie the whole thing about like mm, there's just something about you Job that pisses me off that I thought was just an excellent way to start that movie um but uh no it's not a Job thing or anything like that I mean I'm just uh Job was lucky up to a point you know, until, you know, uh, Satan came along and started, like, saying, hey, God, let's fuck with this dude. And, um, God's like, okay, you, know, you want to go kill some of his people? Go party. But, I mean, he was a lucky dude. He was, like, uh, rich and everything. And I was like, I ain't never been rich. I'm, I have the most money and the most disposable income that I've ever had right now. I've always been poor. My dad had a good job that he lost when I was very young. And this isn't, you won't even believe this. I know I say that a lot, but this is how frightening uh, my father was. They gave him some kind of gay plaque, uh, you know, celebrating him as an employee when they mandatorily retired. And I don't even know how this is possible, but I watched it. But it was plexiglass on a board and it had screws in there. Somehow or another he forced his fingers. And this is like tight to the wood. He forced his fingers into the plexiglass and just shattered it. And just ripped it apart. You know. I mean. I'm going to get you a, a, a picture of what he looked like when he was 55 years old. Because he's out there. And, he, and he's holding like onto a... Uh, uh, log that I think I'm sawing or somebody's sawing or something like that. But before like um, his uh, uh, bad habits caught up to him of like I don't know, smoking millions of unfiltered cigarettes and drinking coffee that was more like a milkshake and um, just you know his high stress life and like going through the horrific childhood he went it all caught up to him. It's like he was formidable at 55 like you know like formidable like <laughs> I walked through him I walked down the street with him and like the worst part of Cleveland like the part of Cleveland that nobody goes to and I was not afraid at all I had no fear <laughs> I was like <laughs> nobody is gonna mess with us not with him they ain't gonna mess with him um They'll be sorry if they do if they don't have a gun, man. They'll be real sorry if they do. So, uh, but yeah, I'll never forget that where, um, you know, that left us dirt poor, but because he wasn't expecting to be mandatorily retired, I don't know if he pissed off management or they just wanted him out of there or whatever, but he was a completely viable worker and actually strong enough and physically able enough to rip apart that um, plaque. Like, I don't even know how he could even get his fingers on it in between the plexiglass and the wood part of the plaque to break it. But I've seen him do it. You know, and I've seen him pull a tooth out of his head without anesthetic. And, uh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's what I grew up with. Um, There. I was thinking about that the other day, but I'll see if I can get that picture off my brother if I ever get to visit my brother, and I'll show you what my dad looked like at about 55 with them big old guns. And they weren't guns. He never lifted a weight or a barbell in his life. He just busted his ass working ever since he was five years old. Illegal child labor. They already had anti-child labor laws, but um, 
uh, he got in a sharecropper situation where he was one of um, 13 children and um, they let him live on this property in exchange for work and that meant everybody worked even the little tiny children so he was doing like farm work he's five years old I, it's, it's even hard to believe or imagine this kind of stuff you know but I've seen the stuff that he did it's like not human used to scare the shit out of me too I think with that plaque scared the shit out of me and one time I was I'm was, a I'm pretty big strong guy and I was trying to move this I told you this before I was trying to move this box out of the truck and I was struggling with it and he goes he goes man what are you gonna take a whole fucking day and he just grabbed it I was trying to like yank on it with two hands and all my might and stuff like that and he just grabbed it with one arm and just pulled it to the back of the truck like it weighed nothing on it. It had a bunch of machine parts in it or something. And I was like, holy shit. You know. Just do stuff like that all the time. Like when he was carrying shingles up when we were roofing my uh roofing my our house in uh I think nineteen eighty one, he would like pile up like three things of eighty pound shingles three packs of 80 pound shingles on his shoulder that's when he stepped on my fingers on the ladder and that, that stuff was crazy and one of his aunts who actually knew <laughs> the uncle that was a serial killer obviously that's her brother but said that he was the scariest person that she'd ever seen and that's like yeah but my other brothers did, did, you know, the serial killer, kill, killer brother and the other um, guy who was a leg breaker and um, the guy who beat the guy up with the uh, little league baseball bat. They wouldn't come around my house. You know, they wouldn't, they didn't, you know, they had respect for my dad as far as like respect meaning fear because that is why he became so good with a knife at a very very young age is because they were bigger and older than him and he wasn't having it and, he, and they knew that he didn't play that if you were going to mess with him that was your life as uh, it says in that Tom Selleck uh, shit uh, F. Murray Abraham movie where Tom Selleck gets thrown in, in jail, he said, and the uh, F. Mary Abraham guy's an old con. He says, "You gotta let you gotta let these people know, like they know with me. If they mess with me, that's their life. You know, that's my life or your life. <laughs> you know, he was like that. And um, yeah, he, you know, I could tell you. Shit, I wish I could tell you that story, but." I will tell you about in a roundabout way is my serial killer uncle wanted to get somebody else involved in the family and where he hijacked a truck and he wanted the truck park the truck on their property and he did not come and ask my dad to do that he asked somebody else to do that and like uh, you know my serial killer uncle threatened the whole family he said he, he threatened to kill him off uh, didn't let him do it you know cause he, up, he had hijacked the truck and he needed a place to put this truck and uh but I never even saw that guy I never even saw my Uncle Bobby cause my dad must have told him that like you come around here Mr. Guy, serial killer you're, you're a dead man you know and uh yeah I never saw anybody that, like, wasn't afraid of my dad. I never saw anybody in my whole life that wasn't afraid of him. You know, I've seen people stand up to him, like, you know, where they didn't have no choice in the matter. Like, maybe once or twice, but it was not over serious situations. For instance, um, 
I guess they don't use the word retarded. And she, I don't know, she was more like just slow, actually. She was actually pretty bright. But they would have called her retarded back then. But I had a relative that was uh, mentally slow. And so they kept all the knives in the house dull because they figured, you know, she would cut herself. So all their knives were really dull. And I spent a lot of time over there as a, as a child. And then, um, you know, there's nothing that would piss my dad off more than a dull knife because of his fondness for knives and keeping them very sharp and for what he did with knives. So he was over there wanting to sharpen their knives all the time. And finally, um, my uncle name withheld on the good side of the family just had to say, look, man, you know, it's because of aim withheld. Like, we can't have sharp knives around here, you know. It's like the only, it's like, wow, somebody's actually talking back to my dad and laying down the fucking law. It's like, I've never seen this before. <laughs> this is fascinating. And he was like, you know, it's your house. It's your house, you know. But up, And he, he would never, like, back down completely from an argument. He'd be like, I'll tell you what, you cut yourself worse with a dull knife than with a sharp knife. And the guy in question with the uh, slow daughter said, you let me worry about that. And uh, that was the end of that. I doubt that my life is that fascinating. That I can... Uh, talk for 121 minutes and be interesting um, yeah so I should probably watch some baseball it's already 5 o'clock in the morning and I gotta you know I gotta wake up in like 5 hours cause I got something to do that's if I go to sleep like right now which isn't gonna happen and um Actually, the PTSD guy on the porch, he seemed like manic to me. Like, he didn't look healthy, but he claimed that he only, you know, he smoked a blunt. He, that's, he says he smokes weed and not drinks beer, but he just seems like, you know, like manic. Like somebody with, like, you know, mental emo and emotional issues. And I know a bit about it, what happened to him when he was young. And uh, I, I can't really blame him for being that way. And, um, yeah, I told him, you know, it pissed him off. I told him outright, I don't want you knocking on my door ever. I said, if you're sitting out here on the porch and I see you, I'll be happy to come out here and talk to you. Because um, that one time he was wanting to hang out with me. I'm like, what are you doing later? You know, I, I'm being an old crippled man later, you know, Mr. 30-year-old <laughs> war vet. <laughs> that's what I'm doing later <laughs> I'm, be, I'm living a boring hideous life of intractable pain and uh, 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 boredom so um, if you, you know I, I, and he left five cigarettes which I can still feel in the mailbox and it got me back into my old habits which um not good I was like uh, I got five cigarettes here that's not good I don't want these in my house it's like, he said he's going to leave me a couple cigarettes but to a smoker five is better than two ten is better than five you know I just, I just you know I just felt for five dollars one cigarette for five dollars that's, 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 that's it's a bit extreme so, you know, my idea was just like, well, if I see it out on the porch, you know, let me bum a cigarette off you every so often and we'll make up that $5. But, uh, yeah, so I smoked all five of them cigarettes, like, you know, and due to my old habits and my old ways, um, it awakened old uh, behaviors involving uh, M&M. And, uh, I was sitting there minding my own business, man, and as soon as I lit, some, lit something up, started smoking, and I started getting horny, and I'm like, I'm watching the least 
I think I was actually just running through my um, um, my downloads to make sure that my audiobooks, the volume level was matching up to the most boring thing imaginable. And I thought about it and I was like, I didn't get my mail today and this is like 5 o'clock in the morning yesterday. About the same time as it is now. I was like, I didn't get my mail. So I went out and I got my Georgia Orwell book, which is over there, which is really small. Uh, called Why I Write and uh, it was in there and then in the bottom was five cigarettes and uh, five camels in a pack I was like well I'm fucked you know because I, that's an addiction for me I can't that's like having booze around alcoholic this is not a good plan I can't be around cigarettes I enjoy the ritual too much you know I didn't get sick I took a blood pressure pill to make sure, like, you know, it wasn't going to affect my heart badly. And, uh, did a little shake and bake. Watched some nasty stuff on the computer. Like I used to do, like, five years ago before I uh, decided that, you know, that behavior was going to kill me. I'm not healthy enough to misbehave in that fashion. Um... But, uh, yeah. I feel like Shahrazad, man. Isn't Shahrazad like she had to keep telling stories or they'd kill her or something like that? Except for I'm not really telling you stories. I'm just telling you a bunch of non sequitur little pieces and tidbits of information about what's going on around here. And this place, this crazy, crazy place. I'm trying and drinking this tea. I think I finally made the guy with the uh, wheelchair understand, you know, I was like, like I, I said, I went over there after I went to my doctor's appointment, like I said yesterday, and I was like, listen, you know, because he's like, that, but that's $700 there, you know, I said, I'm going to, I feel taken advantage of you, I was like, first of all, it's my idea to give it to you in the first place. I don't feel, it, it, it wasn't your, it, you didn't con me out of it. And, uh, second of all, I've had a little bit of a window into your existence. I said, I watched you for seven years. All you do is, this is, this is your life. You, you take the garbage out in your wheelchair. You sit out on the porch with your grandkids. Or you go to doctor's appointments. That's it. He goes, yeah, that's pretty much my life. And I said, it, I said, if I, he said something earlier about I'm going to feel bad, you know, when I'm riding that around and you're in your house. And I said, I'm going to be feeling good because I'm going to, it's going to be good to see you have something else to do. You know, like, I don't know, you know, they make good TV nowadays and good TV shows and all that and stuff. But I always feel like, um, you know, I don't know. I just like, I, you know how they say pulled the cable? I pulled the cable like back in freaking 1996, 1997, 1998. I just went a whole year with no TV at all. And it was like, hmm, you can actually survive. It's like you can actually, you know, just do other things don't have to watch TV. You can actually go outside. You can go fishing. You can ride bicycles. You can climb a freaking tree. You can go in the park. You can talk to people. You can read books. There's lots of things you can do besides sitting on your ass, getting fat, getting lazy, and uh, uh, not getting your endorphins rush. I don't know what kind of endorphin rush people get get from watching the TV shows, but the TV shows they make nowadays are pretty damn killer. I have to admit, they're pretty good. But I'd still rather just be doing something else. Like um, that's why I work so hard at audiobooks because it's just something else that I can do. That's actually productive. I don't feel productive watching the fruits of somebody else's labor. You know, there's nobody even here to discuss, like, um, 
what's going on in the show. <laughs> you know. Uh, or like try to figure out what if it's a mystery, like you do that play that game or you're like you're trying to figure out what's happening like when you watch a crim uh, Law and Order Criminal One Ten or something. I'm starting to pretty feel pretty weird so I think I am going to get off here and uh, yeah this is another long one but um, for my maybe I have 90 subscribers to the channel I don't know what that means I don't know what any of this means and I, when they go through the analytics and the arrows go up and down I just ignore it I do my thing you know because I'm not going to change to uh, get more viewers. I'm never going to put ads in any of my stuff. If we're going to try to make any money off of YouTube. I'm never going to try to be likable. <laughs> I'm probably never going to clean up my language. You know. I, I, I'm going to follow my own standards. I don't care. It's one thing about being poor all your life. Is I don't care. And I'm not a people pleaser. Because people don't seem to like me a whole lot anyway so I don't have to worry about pleasing them they are displeased with me on site so yeah anybody that gets threatened for to get beat to death in a laundromat because they say hey are those your clothes over there the next thing you know somebody's threatening to beat you to death uh, yeah you kind of like you know you're kind of like an anti Dale Carnegie. How to win friends. How's, how's that? What's the name of that title of that book? How to influence people and win friends. My, it's, mine is more like how to make people hate you <laughs> and want to beat your ass. I could write that book. And I think I'm just naturally talented. Like, you can never become uh, a great writer. You just have to have. You know, no matter how hard you work at it, I, I hate to tell you this and disappoint you in this way. You will never have my talents for people instantly despising you on sight. <laughs> That's just a natural gift that I have. <laughs> that is a God given talent. It's like, uh, you know. We all have our talents and the things that we excel at. And, and false modesty. I mean, why should I be modest about the fact that people hate my guts? <laughs> and, that, that they, and that they look at me, their first reaction is, you're a son of a bitch, man. <laughs> it's before I open my mouth. Now, I used to be pretty before I would open my mouth. Um, uh, you know, I was considered sexually desirable uh, way back when I had hair and all that stuff. Then people would be nice to me for a little while. But then once I uh, lost my looks, uh, then, you know, yeah, then things changed a little bit. But, you know, and, yeah, I was trying to think about the my first time that I, I had like it's not my first gay encounter okay but this is the first time that anything like this I might have already told the story before but everybody knew that this dude was gay the dude's I'm not going to out the dude but I think he wears women's clothing so out, outing him at this point would probably not matter but his his last name was Meadows, you know. But anyways, that was uh, the boat guy's friend. Everybody in the known universe knew that this guy was a homosexual, except for the boat guy. The boat guy is a homophobe, but he has no gaydar whatsoever. So, anyways. I'm living with the boat guy. We're in our 20s. I am freaking gorgeous. There's just no getting around that. So, you know. He's sitting there talking to me and I'm washing dishes. I'm just in the middle of washing dishes. And I said, oh, you're a little bit early. 
you know, uh, uh, Mike will be coming home. He's Mike's, Mike's friend, the boat guy. So I was like, yeah, he'll be coming home, you know, here shortly or whatever. And then he was sitting there and talking to me. And he said, he actually said this. He was like, that's an interesting system you got for washing dishes. You like fill up one side of the you know, uh, dish. And then instead of like rinsing each dish individually underneath the faucet, you just have like uh, a pool of water that you just dip the dishes through, you know? And I'm like, what kind of fucking conversation is this? And uh, I was like, yeah, you know, that's just the way I was taught to do it. You know, I grew up, my, my parents come from the depression where you didn't waste any damn thing, not even water, you know. Then he started talking to me some more, and then he ran his fingers through my hair and said, called me Captain Hairdo. <laughs> and I was like, dude, <laughs> what did you just do? <laughs> he, was, he was like, <laughs> I caressed my head and ran his fingers. Called me Captain Hairdo and ran his fingers through my hair. <laughs> and I was like, you know, I guess later on he just went went the uh, drag queen route later on. But it was it was just funny to everybody. Like you know, nobody wanted to tell um, the boat guy that his friend was a homosexual because um, he was just a homophobe. Which I don't think he hated. He didn't hate him, but he was just like. You know, homophobe implies hate. It was just like, he was always like, he was a, t he went, in, we went into a hot tub now, like with guys. He went into a hot tub in his underwear because he's afraid of homosexuals. So it's like me and this other guy, you go into a hot tub and get naked. It's just how you do it. He had a cool setup with a hot tub too. And it was sweet because. Um, you could see your breath like he had like an enclosure like that had mosquito netting but it was cold outside but it was a hot tub so you could actually sit in the hot tub and be warm and see your breath at the same time you know, it'd be like it'd be like 40 degrees outside so that was really cool but he would not take off his underwear to get into the hot tub he got into the hot tub and the underwear like we're not going to mess with you, dude. You know, that's the kind of homophobia I'm talking about. Not the homophobia that leads you to, like, um, you know, try to beat someone up or something like that. But anyways, yeah, that guy, uh, yeah, my brother was like, never could understand that. The dude that had the Playboy channel. Now, this is back, way back in the day, you know, before porn was, like, easily accessible and all that. He said... Playboy Channel was one of like the first things that you got to see any uh, titties. And I think you saw some, I don't know what all you saw on there. I didn't have the Playboy Channel or how explicit it was. But uh, he was like, the dude had the Playboy Channel. And he passed it up on the dial. And we asked him to go back to it. And he was like, oh yeah, I've had the Playboy Channel for years. He's like, I don't really watch it. <laughs> I, was like, I was like do you need to be hit over the head with a foam baseball bat that says to do gay to do gay <laughs> like, like, you don't want to look at titties <laughs> you don't want to look at bush <laughs> come on now <laughs> God, it's just funny but uh yeah uh I don't he don't hate gay people but he's, you know, I don't know who the hell knows what happened to him. But uh, it's not, you know, they say that homophobe. That's just like fear of homo, fear of homosexuality. Or but really, who knows what the language changes? So who knows what it means nowadays? It may, it may be an offensive term now. Who knows? You know, somebody could be upset over it. But uh, I had arguments with homosexuals on the internet about what a homophobe is or you know, or what it implies and stuff like that. And I'm just, these semantic arguments about the meanings of words are in themselves meaningless because they will change at some point or another. Um, that's why basic English is the way to go and getting back to what I was talking about before. 
the simplest way to say something is the best. To tell somebody to um, please, sir, leave my property. I do not wish to see you anymore. I don't ever really want to ever see you again. I mean, it's it's not a personal thing. It's like, uh, but I don't. The best way to do that is just say, fuck you. <laughs> or get the fuck out of here. <laughs> it's much more effective. Than, to, than to, to the whole patter, patter, patter. You know, please ab, please abdicate the the president. The the uh, yeah, abdicate is like giving away a throne. But uh, yeah, please abscond from my property, sir. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> this is much more effective. All right, I'm silly and uh, making a ridiculously long and stupid video. So, um. I'm going to leave you to it before I destroy my vocal cords. I will probably have more clerical type work to do on my audiobook. And I'm saving a good night's sleep for when I. so I can read good. And uh, sooner or later I'm going to have that. And I can probably even hammer out those what's left in a day if I have sleep and a good voice day. But me talking forever on here, not going to help. My average view time is, I think I do, I do look at my average view time. I don't really look at the arrows or pointing up and down the analytics. But my average view time is like 21 minutes. And uh, that means I must get tiresome, I guess. It could be like, click on, click off. Or, you know, who knows what it means. I don't really care. I'm not looking to make any money. Not looking to really make any friends. I'm look always looking to learn, you know. And like I said, there's interesting people on here that have interesting things to say and common experiences. It's like I'm not really looking so much as to form friendships as to learn and to uh, um, maybe even serve a purpose as like a distraction. Because I had one guy on tell me, he said, he said, well, I can listen to your videos. I don't have to learn anything. <laughs> I'm like, not sure how to take that, but, you know, um, yeah. hey, as long as you're watching them and you're getting some kind of entertainment value off of them, that's cool. You know, uh, but I, remember, <laughs> I didn't know how to take that. He was like, something I like about your videos is like, I I don't have to learn anything. And it's like, uh, I think he just meant that they're just strictly for entertainment value. So, uh, yeah. Even though I try to, like, imp throw in some facts and impart things, it's like, uh, it's mostly uh, just me amusing myself. And uh, trying to be amusing. And, um, Sometimes you need a guy there that's like a signpost that's like pointing out the absurd, like like how ridiculous a thing is. Because sometimes people aren't good at recognizing that or finding the humor in things like that, you know. Um, and the absurdity of my life in the last year is of such epic proportions that I don't think I need to tell anybody. I, I, don't, I don't think I need to be a sign point and just point out how ridiculous something is. Like, I mean, I felt like I had to point out that the reason why the one doctor didn't want uh, my test on a disc is he wanted a first opinion from people that wanted him to give a second opinion. You know, I, had, I, th I felt like I had to point that out. Like, um, okay, if you're the second opinion, why do you need to hear the first opinion? <laughs> Your opinion is supposed to be different than their opinion. So I felt like I had to point that out, you know, because that's a little bit uh, 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 tricky there. But I don't think I have to point out things like uh, I'm trying to go through a uh, benzo withdrawal and my landlord decides to... Uh, rent to somebody who's been in prison and has been arrested multiple times 
school opens up a meth house across the street so I am actually going through benzo withdrawal and uh, fighting off a meth trade <laughs> in my neighborhood like fucking Batman <laughs> How ridiculous that was like think of yourself like um going through a benzo withdrawal and then like having to deal with um uh, a meth crisis and having to actually pick up a machete and walk out in the hallway and confront drug dealers with it and having to call police and um you know, having death threats made against you, and you're all, all the time you're trying to get off of one of the worst chemical substances uh, to get off in the world. Like, I don't have to say, that's funny. That's absurd. That's just ridiculous, you know. But other things you, you kind of got to point out to people. Like, um, this whole thing now, like, um, where this place above me getting paid by for the government apparently the population is a population explosion up there um and how like um all how hard i work to uh get the meth trade out of here and then i get the meth trade out of here but uh the guy is actually in prison who is on the lease so he just he gets arrested, but he just gives his keys to other meth people. So, they're his guests, technically. Because he's not been convicted of a crime yet. So, they have the right to be there. So, the meth thing continues. And then finally, I get my landlord to kick them out. Because I am on top of his ass day and night. And he's like, this Steve guy is not going to leave me alone. Until I throw these people out. So, um... You know, he finally evicts them, and they squat, and they it takes the whole summer to get rid of them. And I'm like, oh, thank God, they're gone. And then the next people that move in are Stampy and Stampy Jr. and Stampy Sr. and little kids. And, like, apparently there's eight people up there now. And I am... I have gone from living in my living room, looking out the window, watching drug dealers go down, to uh, being trapped in this prison cell with an eight-foot hole in my wall. You know, so, yeah, I really don't think that I need to point out the absurdity of that and the uh, uh, humor. It's a... Mind you, it's a very black humor. As uh, no, is that racist? It's a very dark humor, I think they call it. It's an it's a very African American uh, humor. Um, uh, you would call it African African American comedy. Um, it's like uh, uh, it's it's like it's my life has become some sort of satire, or something like that. And then I go to the doctor and I'm begging for surgeries. And they can't wait to rack up medical bills and, and surgeries. You know, I've, I've actually looked at a bill for my back surgery. And I, I don't know what this bill would cost now, you know, with inflated prices since this was 30 years ago. But it was $80,983. For my surgery. So. So. It's like. I'm going around begging people. Cut me. Just cut me. Just please cut me. And I can't get them to do it. And they're like. Oh, we don't really want to operate on your knee. And I'm like. I'm telling you. It's like. And, and my experience means nothing. You know. It was like my long medical experience. It just means nothing. To medical people. It's like. Why do you not believe me when I say that I am fucked up? It's like, this is the story of my life. I have growing pains in my legs, I say when I'm 14 years old. Or no, I say I have pains in my legs. The doctors say, oh, that's just growing pains. 
and I'm growing a spinal tumor and going to a chiropractor. And then I say, at the age of 18, I've got some serious, like, weird fucking things going on. My legs are on fire. Oh, that's just post-operative stuff. That'll go away. And it's like, no. I contracted a rare, dis incurable disease called CRPS that, will, that basically plunges you into another world uh, full of obnoxious and incalculably weird sensations. Um, it's like, I go in ambulances, I got, and I'm telling them, I got a red me, and they're like, you just need to calm down, you'll be fine. It's like, no, I have a red me, I put me on an EKG, quit talking. You know, it's like, at what point will I be believed? You know, it reminds me of a story, like, um, uh, that I heard somebody tell, where they said they had, this is supposed to be true, mind you, but uh, somebody died, and what they wanted to put, on their tombstone was simply I told you I was sick <laughs> that's all they wanted on their tombstone apparently that's true there's a tombstone somewhere that says I told you I was sick and then it has their name of course and the date they lived and died but that's all you know not like uh, uh, some kind of fancy um, uh, epitaph it's just like I told you I was sick. That's what I should probably put on my, my uh, tombstone. Are you going to listen now? Or like, uh, or, or do you think I'm dead? <laughs> That's what I should put like, like, like on my tombstone. It's like, are you sure I'm dead? <laughs> because they're never sure when I tell them anything else. You know. Um, I'm telling them like the knee is not a doable thing. You need to operate on it. And it's like I'm just they won't do nothing for it and like they won't operate on it they, they don't they're not they don't seem to take me seriously it's like what do i have to do to be taken seriously i mean um i've had parts cut out of me i should be six foot four i'm very resentful for for that they took a vertebrae out of me a big vertebrae so i should be six foot four which would be a dandy height man i would have been a lady killer supreme if i had a, a sane mind with all that gorgeous hair and these chiseled uh, uh, movie star features I got and all that man six foot four and uh, a, a mesomorph you know into lifting weights man all cut six pack the works just a fucking walking wet dream and uh, yeah and it's like I've had now I got rib cut out and I got parts cut out on me cut out of me and uh, went through all these medical stuff and I just can't get medical people to take me seriously and it's just like a joke every time I go to the doctor it's just like a fucking joke it's like like well you know we go to one place and they're like well we don't fax the records go to this other place we don't accept nothing but faxes go to this one place it's like, uh, um, we only put stuff on a disc. Go to, go to get a second opinion. And the guy's like, I need the first opinion before I can give him my second opinion. And I'm like, I'm thinking, um, this has got to be the most, one of the most ridiculous lives in the history of humanity. I mean, it's just so stupid. I am actually going to a chiropractor, practitioner and have them let, twist me around and crack my back while there is a spinal tumor growing inside my spine pushing on my spinal cord causing damage this guy's cracking my back like that's going to help it because the doctor said i had growing pains you know i said i had a bunch of pain in my legs and they were like ah that's natural son it's natural if you're fucking andre the giant man i wasn't gonna i don't have gigantism you know, I'm not going to grow like 10 inches in a year. Um, yeah. So I, I'm not really bitter about all that. I mean, I got some bitterness in me about other stuff. Like, my bitterness is all centered around the people and the way they behave. You know, it's like, um, that's what I, I'm not bitter about all, like, um, what's happened to me physically all that much. I mean, I wish it didn't happen, of course, but I'm not like all, 
I don't feel the same way about that as I do about like uh, the way people have acted who are supposed to be my friends and family. And, you know, I know they're just not well in the head, and, you know, um, that a lot of it is not meant maliciously. You know, it, it comes across that way. And, uh, just, oh, uh, man, if, if I could sit there and tell you, you know, I've talked for two hours now. It's ridiculous. But if I could sit there and I could tell you my whole life story from beginning to end, if I had the energy, maybe some bennies, I think they used to call them back in the day, uh, maybe just a pot of coffee, just a pot of my dad's coffee, and I could tell you my whole life story, you would be like, what the fuck? I was like, man, you got to, you know, somebody is really fucking what you do. It's like, uh, I don't know what, you know, I heard of born under a bad sign, man. You was born under a bad whole fucking <laughs> group of signs, man. You, you, you were born over the whole, uh, over a whole, uh, uh, shit. All right, I'm drawing a blank, a blank. I usually, I'm usually pretty good at that on the fly shit. But, uh, yeah. I was thinking astrological science and I couldn't come up with nothing and I was thinking literature and I couldn't come up with nothing. So, yeah, I do pretty good when I, for on the fly and uh, spontaneous. But, yeah, I get the big F for that one. I get the big, couldn't quite pull that off. But that is all right with me. I'm going to watch the, the sun is coming up. It's, it's already, it's 527 according to this clock over here, 528 now. And it's already getting light out, man. This reminds me of the kid when I used to go fishing. When I snuck in the park and uh, stole them trout that one day. And uh, had that guy come up to me and try to bully me. This is about the time when I started catching fish so fast that I was flipping on them over my head. I wasn't putting them on a string or in a bag. I was just catching them too darn fast. I never had nothing like that. Unhook them, cast it out there, throw them. Then I looked behind me and they, I had to throw them far enough on the bank so that they wouldn't flop back in the water because ain't nothing as flippy and as floppy as a trout on a bank because uh, they are a fighting fish. That is God's fish, man. If ever, if. You know, my, my brother laughs at me when I use that phrase. But I said, man, a trout is God's fish. Because they fight the best. They're delicious. And you get the most meat off them when you clean them. And they're beautiful to boot. They got it all. Man, they are, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, I'm trying to be clever. and not, I'm, again, trying to be clever. And it ain't working out. So it's time to go. Um, so anyways, yeah, my average uh, duration now is probably going to be about 17 minutes. So, But yeah, I'm in a pretty good mood. And I have no reason for being in a good mood other than the fact that uh, I had a good day yesterday. And um, the PTSD guy is not as pissed off at me anymore which I enjoy that fact because uh, I don't know if he has any weapons in the building or not I don't I, I hope not so I don't want yeah wait a minute I said I was looking for a good death though yeah that could be a socially significant death too because it could speak to uh uh Man, it hasn't mattered in the past. But I was thinking, yeah, man, if a war vet kills me, like, that's got PTSD, it's like, uh, it's a win-win. Because it, it'll, it'll make a social statement about war. And then I won't have to, you know, keep getting fucked around by the universe as, you know, booted around like a football. And I won't have to go through all this misery. But I don't know if he has any weapons here or not. I don't know. I know. I know that. Uh, he 
he said some stuff yesterday that would uh, curdle a cow's milk while it was still in the damn udder. But, uh, yeah. Uh, maybe I should just piss that guy off enough. To, nah, I wouldn't want to do that to him. End up in jail or a psych unit or something. Too nice, man. Too nice to get somebody to kill me, man. I don't want Sir Hand, Sir Hand to do time over me. Or Jack Ruby or nothing like that. I'm just too I'm just too nice, man. That's my problem. Just yeah, that's yeah. I, I'm not even you know, Gandhi like he he just like committed suicide more or less because he had a lot he he had a lot of people that was kind of upset with him, you know, and he used to go around with bodyguards and he was like I don't want to go around with bodyguards no more and he you know he's Gandhi, kind of a big deal, you know that's kind of you know that's that's kind of a, he was kind of a rock star so people did what he said so he went around without a bodyguard somebody shot his ass and killed him. And, um, but I don't know how that, uh, kind of behavior is in keeping with this whole theory of non-violence, though. If he's giving people a chance to be violent, went out a hypocrite, perhaps, I'll have to give that further thought. You know, the next time I'm going to go at 5.30 in the morning and the sun is arising, and I don't get to go fishing. I used to love to go fishing in the morning at this time of day. It's all quiet out, man. Sometimes the mist would be coming off the water. You know? And uh, it'd be cold. It'd be cool out. You know? And then you could, it would warm up through the day. I remember once we went out on boats and it was so foggy out that nobody could start up their engines. And it was a Saturday. And it was on Seneca Lake. And everybody was out on the water but nobody could start up their engines because you couldn't see shit because it was like London pea soup fog and there was just you could just hear conversations you know in the water you know and you were talking to people that you couldn't see in the fog until the fog lifted nobody was going nowhere because nobody could you know you would like you're just trying to keep from running your boats into each other. It was so thick you couldn't see nothing. And uh, you, that was some serious game of Marco Polo there. But we were all having conversations with people we couldn't even see. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't my best fishing day, but that was funny as hell. Just a bunch of people, man, just raring to go fishing, but... That's the thickest fog I was ever in. And, uh, yeah, nobody could start up an engine. Start up an engine and just slam into some other boat. That's what would have happened. There was all these boats just floating around, you know. And occasionally, you know, you'd have, one would drift over by you and you'd have to push off, push them away from you and stuff like that. But you wouldn't see them until they were, you wouldn't even see them until they within, were within 15 feet of you. Because it was, yeah, it was the real deal. Thank God I was healthy once. And uh, I have at least some interesting, well, that's interesting to me. That might be boring as hell to you, but uh, that was interesting. That was an inter it's probably one of them things like if you're in the middle of it, it's a more interesting experience, you know. If you're in the middle of it. Some things are just funny from the outside. And some things are funny from the inside. Or interesting from the inside. Like it's always going to be funny. That I picked up a turtle. A turtle. I was fishing a turtle. Like that big around. Like a snapping turtle. They walk across land. And they do it kind of funny. They're like stiff legged. And they walk. You know. And he's walking along. And I was like. Hey little, little guy. What's up? pick up the snapping turtle and the snapping turtle had a John he was he had like the John Holmes model neck of a snapping turtle so I'm holding him pretty far away from my face and I'm like hey dude what's up he bites me right on the end of my nose really hard and uh 
I had to go into school the next day and explain to people that the reason why my nose has this ridged mark all the way down it is because I got bit in the nose by a turtle. And I don't know how many people believe me, but everybody in the school asked me, and it was a small school, but everybody that encountered me that talks to me that day asked me that question, like, what the hell happened to your nose? And I just told him the truth. I said I got bit by a turtle. And then I had to explain the circumstances. And I said, how did I know that the turtle had a nose that was longer than its entire body that belonged on a porn star uh, uh, nether regions? Because I was familiar with wild creatures. I knew animals and animals and I did not hold that thing you know I know what a snapping turtle is and what they can do that motherfucker he had a mata mata type neck on him I mean it was crazy and I was like and, and of course my friends was with me and they saw that shit and one of them almost literally He's like, I just can't, I, I just stop, I, I, I can't, you know, he's like, I don't know if you ever laugh so hard that it, it hurts your ribs, like when I saw Hot Tub Time Machine, I was la I was drunk, but I was laughing so hard that it was hurting my ribs, I was like, please, just God, please stop, you know, but he saw that, you know, <laughs> and witnessed it, and he was rolled out on the ground, man, and he was like holding his side, and he's like, oh, I can't breathe, I can't, I can't breathe. He was laughing so hard. So that's the way I look at um, the things that I, I talk about on here. It's like, to me, it's all just that snapping turtle biting me on, on the nose, you know. Even though this stuff seems pretty horrific that I go through, it's just all according to a theme or a pattern set a very long time ago as far as my life. That's all this is. It's just it's just a snap of turtle bite me in the nose. It's just a, a ridiculous, absurd a turn turn of events that I am built like you know, the universe is just enjoys playing these practical jokes on me. And um, you know it's just like when I was a kid and I was like picking blackberries. I'm eating blackberries. And the next thing I know, I'm getting attacked by a hive of bees that live in the blackberries. Now, like, I've been eating blackberries off of this bush for a good half hour. At what point did these bees get pissed off at me? Do they eat the blackberries? Are they like, you know, this is a greedy motherfucker, man. We're going to teach him a lesson. What exactly happened there? I don't know. Or like the time I was sitting in a cherry tree for over half an hour eating cherries and I ate so many cherries that I actually apparently gained enough weight that the branch broke and I fell into a briar bush and I was all tangled up in this briar bush and uh, my cousin who I just talked to yesterday um, from Florida or he lives in Florida now he was like, man, I'll save you because I was unconscious. I was knocked unconscious after I ate so many cherries that I got so fat that the branch that was perfectly fine for half an hour just decided to break underneath me. Um, I was knocked out and I wasn't answering him and they were freaking freaked out and thought I was dead or something like that. So he's like, I'll save you. He starts hacking away at these briar bushes and I wake up to, uh, uh, you know, I got, I'm, got thorns in in me like all over me and he's yanking on them and stuff and I'm like just stop 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 I'll get out of here myself stop and I mean they were everywhere they were like wrapped around my private say so I was I, I was just I was you know I didn't have a crown of thorns I had a bed of thorns I was just laying in thorns and um you know if you can't find the humor in that kind of stuff I mean I guess we're very different people because that shit is funny. And it doesn't make any sense at all. You know, it's like, did I, how could I eat so many cherries that suddenly the branch breaks? You know, it's like, and of course, later on when they realized I wasn't dead and got, I got out of there and I had all the p 
10 pricks in me from the thorns. Uh, they were like, how many cherries did you eat? And he just was making fun of me and shit. Um, yeah. I do have a friend. I, I, I have a... I don't think he'll mind me telling you this story. Since we're, 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 in, we're in epic uh, range now. This is the longest video I ever made. Um, I just feel like talking. Um, but this guy shot out a plane. He's the only person I've ever known that shot out a plane. But I guess they have these Piper planes. They're like these small planes and his dad told him he had access to firearms at like you know in single deaths digits and his dad always told him anybody comes on to your property you shoot him so he just happened to have his rifle with him and he had a sling for it and he was climbing up these electrical towers not climbing this electrical tower too and it was like one of them big ones like that like got to be like a hundred at least a hundred feet high 150 feet high so i climbed it and i you know one day and i looked down and i'm like man if i fall i'm dead meat and i started to get a little bit nervous and i'm like okay i think i proved my point you know and i'm macho and i can climb my 10 year old ass back down this thing but anyways this dude's like 10 years old 11 years old 12 years old he's got like a rifle and uh, he cl he's climbing up that tower, and uh, he sees a plane flying over their property, and he shoots the plane. <laughs> he didn't shoot it down, but he knows he hit it. He said, I know I hit it. He said, I, I heard it. He's like, I know I hit it. I shot it. So I, I said, did you shoot it again? He said, no, I did my job. My dad taught me that anybody, anybody that comes onto our property, I should shoot them. So, I did my job. <laughs> I wonder what the people on the plane thought or if they even knew. You know. <laughs> you got a 12-year-old kid shooting a plane with a rifle from an electrical tower from like 100 feet up. Yeah, I could tell you some not-so-funny stories about that, that uh, particular individual, but I don't think he'd mind me telling you that one. And now I will definitely say, well, I can't say that word, so I would just say goodbye. Uh, I could say aloha. I was going to say a arrivederci, I think. Isn't that, isn't that like Italian for goodbye? I don't know. I'm just a poor, uneducated fool that the universe likes to kick around like a football. So... I don't know a lot of these things like languages and whatnot so yeah or of war or of war is that like French for goodbye arrivederci au revoir reservoir or whatever that word is adios um yeah ciao Aloha. Uh, get the fuck out of here. That is how we said goodbye when we were younger. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm going to get the fuck out of here. <laughs>